So the key price in our model, as we've seen from the analysis, is going to be the real interest rate. Um, here it's the price that's going to determine everything, because in a sense, you know, there are two goods in the model. There are services and uh, bonds. And what matters is the price of serv you know, services relative to bonds. Um, and, and that price, so you know, the price of services, uh, you know, you have to, so it's the relative price that matters. So if we express everything in terms of services, so we look at, at so the price of services, we take it to be one, we look at a real economy, then services are price of one. And then what's the price of bonds? It's going to be the real interest rate or relative to real interest rate because the real interest rate gives us returns on bonds. So the real, if the real interest rate is high, then bonds become more attractive relative to services. If the real interest rate is low, bonds become less attractive relative to services. So the so real interest rate is really um, the key price in the model. And indeed, we saw when we looked at uh, uh, when we computed uh, the optimum of the of the household's problem, so when we found the best the optimal behavior by household, we saw that the only price that showed up at the end in our necessary in our conditions for optimality is the real interest rate um, that showed up in the law of motion for the costed variable. There were no other price, you know, like the price of services PT that had dropped out, the nominal interest rate had dropped out, and the, and the only thing that was left. Once we have re-expressed, you know, the budget constraint in real terms, and then put down the necessary condition, was that real interest rate? So that's the key price in the model, the real interest rate, and it's going to determine, you know, everything that matters it's because it captures, um, it's basically the relative price of um, government bonds. Uh, so it's relative price of government bonds. So uh, relative to services. So if we want to know uh, if we want to know how the model behaves, we've got to know what is the real interest rate. Now the real interest rate we denote it by RT, it's uh, the nominal interest rate IT minus inflation rate by T. So if we want to know how the real interest rate behaves, we've got to know how the inflation rate behave, and we've got to know the nominal interest rate behave. And so here we have two things. Nominal interest rate, that's going to be determined by monetary policy. So we've got to specify monetary policy to know what the nominal interest rate is. Then the inflation rate, we know that it's a gross rate of prices. Um, and so if we want to know what the inflation rate is, we need to know what the price of services does. And here we're in a matching model. Uh, we know that prices for services are determined in a situation of bilateral monopoly, you know, where the customer and the producer are matched. There's a surplus to be divided. So we know that we have to specify a price norm that's going to give us the price of services. And therefore, once uh, we look at the gross rate of that, that's going to give us the inflation rate. So we need to uh, specify both monetary policy and the price norm here. From then, we'll infer the real interest rate. Uh, so let's start with the price norm. So again, that, that's necessary because here, you know, the price is not determined by an auctioneer on the market, or it's not determined by some monopolies that set prices. Prices are set in situation of bilateral monopoly once customer and producer have match. And we know if you're a producer, you know, once you find somebody, you always would like to sell services to them instead of going back to unemployment because you know unemployment you don't get any income if you're a customer you always would rather work with that producer that you find than trying to find somebody else because finding producer is costly you know you have to actually recruit this producer and spend uh, recruiting uh, you have to spend money on recruiting so we have bilateral monopoly we need to specify a price mechanism uh, in the basic model, you know, we did a lot of analysis, and in the two market model, we did a lot of analysis with fixed prices. Here we have a dynamic model, so we want something a bit more general than just a fixed price. 
Um, so what we're going to assume, instead of assuming that we have a fixed price, we're going to uh, assume that we have a price that grows at a constant inflation rate. So that will allow us to have non-zero inflation in the model, which is something that actually new Keynesian models have really a hard time doing because with scalable pricing, once you have uh, you know, inflation, trend inflation that complicates things a lot, here it's not going to change anything. It's not going to make anything more complicated. That's a big advantage uh, because, of course, there is inflation in the real world. Um, so here we're going to have uh, a price mechanism whereby the price of services grows at a constant inflation rate. Um, so basically, customers and producers in the model, they expect inflation to be constant. Uh, and so they expect prices to grow at that constant rate. Um, and so th this is a price that's always satisfied for all services. Uh, and, you know, until a year or two ago, this was a very good assumption because if you look at the US in the past 40 years, uh, inflation had been, you know, since the 90s, inflation has been very stable, around 2%, not responding when the market was tight, not responding when the market was tight. So assuming, a, you know, if somebody goes around and assumes that prices grow at a constant inflation rate, you actually would have a very good depiction of how uh, prices evolved. Uh, so prices grow at constant inflation rate, which will just denote uh, P. So this means that our price of services PT is just going to be uh, X of pi T. And so this will, uh, so this will give you uh, a price that grows at a constant inflation rate. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you know, it doesn't really change anything. We could even generalize it and call it P of zero, X of pi T. Uh, so this, you know, allows you to have different price level P zero at which you start, but that's totally irrelevant. Uh, so we're going to assume that starting from P zero, we'll have this constant uh, inflation rate. Okay, and so in a world like that, in which prices grow at that constant inflation rate P, where P is a parameter of the model, then, you know, we have that, of course, P dot T over PT is equal, which is how we define our inflation rate, is just equal to P, our parameter here. Uh, and, and notice P can be um, positive, can be negative, it can be zero, uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, Okay, so this is our price norm, constant inflation rate, uh, growth rate of prices given by P. Um, so that's good. And of course, in reality, so here P is a parameter, it can't be influenced by anything. Of course, in reality, you know, the reason why inflation was so stable was because um, the, central, the Fed communicated you know, that they would do everything to keep inflation constant. So in the long run, P is going to be determined you know, by communication uh, from the Fed. It's going to be determined by like long run monetary policy. But here, because we have a short run model, we're going to just take P as given. Um, second thing we have to do is we have to think about monetary policy to figure out how uh, nominal interest rates are set. Um, and here we're going to take the simplest monetary policy. We'll just assume that the central banks follows an interest rate peg. That is, they maintain the nominal interest rate at some level. And so we'll assume that at any point t, the nominal interest rate i t is just equal to some level i. And We'll also impose that uh, the central bank is subject to a zero lower bound constraint, subject to a zero lower bound constraint. That is, we'll impose that 
of parameter i that gives the nominal interest rate has to be positive. So we assume the central bank is not allowed to set a nominal, nominal uh, negative nominal interest rate. And you know you can easily generalize that. You could say that you have some kind of effective lower bound that's not zero. Maybe like the central bank is able to set nominal interest rates that are slightly negative, you know, maybe minus half a percent, minus one percent, whatever, and that there is some kind of bound. Everything would would go through. You would just, you know, you could adjust the analysis to that, it doesn't really matter. And, and in fact, we'll see the model behave exactly the same at the zero lower bound. So this switch which we'll call always ZLB. At the ZLB, away from it, the model behaves the same. You don't have these weird anomalies that you see in the new Keynesian model that do not exist here. The model is very well behaved at the ZLB or away from it. And in fact, it's very well behaved at any lower bound or away from it. So you can change the lower bound if, uh, if you'd like to. The model allows you to think about this. So uh, monetary policy just uh, says that your nominal interest rate is constant uh, at some level i. And of course, if that shock hits the model and like unemployment moves around and tightness moves around, the uh, central bank is allowed to change that uh, nominal interest rate. But but we assume that if there are no shocks. Uh, the central bank just sets an interest rate that's constant. And then later on in the course, we'll study optimal monetary policy, where we'll describe what is the level of interest rate I that the central bank should set to maximize welfare. You know, But then I would be given by an optimal monetary policy rule that's adjusted any time that a shock hits the system. But absent any shock, the central bank just keeps the nominal interest rate at some level I. Um, so that, I think, you know, in the new Keynesian model, uh, people often assume that there's this Taylor rule where the central bank automatically adjusts interest rate when inflation moves, but that's not how uh, central banking works. You know, nominal interest rate is fixed at whatever it is, and then, if, you know, you have uh, meetings from time to time where central bankers, uh, the board of governors of the Fed meet, and then they look at what has happened to the economy, what are the disturbances that have happened, they look at the latest statistics, and then Sometimes they keep the dominant interest rate at the same level, and sometimes they reset it at a new level to capture all the changes that have happened to the economy. So here, that's exactly what we are doing here. We are assuming that without any changes, nominal interest rate remains the same, and then if there are some disturbances, we'll allow the central bank to change uh, to change that. There are unexpected disturbances um, that hit the economy. Um, so it's simpler than assuming a uh, Taylor rule, but I think it's not. Uh, I don't think it's less realistic. I think it captures more how the Fed behaves, which is to set an interest rate until some disturbance occurs, at which point they are going to change, uh, they are going to change the interest rate. Uh, of course, yeah, sometimes you have a bit some dynamics that are going to, to occur and the Fed is going to com you know, commit or announce that like a pass of interest rates uh, you know, and you have this kind of element of central uh, of forward guidance. That's something that we could also capture in the model by allowing, you know, a pass of interest rate, which would create some dynamics, and we could study that. Um, but I think as a first pass, it's fine to just assume that the nominal interest rate is fixed. Um, so here we have um, fixed inflation rate given by a parameter, which we call pi, fixed nominal interest rate given by another parameter, i. And so as a result, the real interest rate is fixed in the model. R is just uh, I minus pi. So uh, your real interest rate is essentially a parameter of the model here. And, uh, you know, the real interest rate can be negative if inflation is positive. If inflation is bigger than the nominal interest rate, then your real interest rate is going to be, uh, to be negative here. That's totally fine. The only constraint that we have, in fact, is that the real interest rate has to be less than the time discount rate. Uh, we have to assume this because if your real interest rate is more than your time discount rate, nobody would want to consume at all. People would only want to save. Your model will be degenerate. So we just have to make sure that the real rate is less than the time discount rate for the model to behave okay. Uh, but the real rate, uh, the real rate can be negative. That's no problem at all. Uh, 